All right, so last time we introduced uh, uh, another new concept in this part, which is the angular uh, momentum. So the uh, formal definition of angular momentum is a cross product between two vectors. But in this class, uh, we don't need to worry about that definition. We don't need to worry about the direction of the angular uh, momentum. It's very un uh, no intuitive, right? As I said last time, if the thing is rotating this way, actually the angular momentum is uh, per uh, perpendicular to the rotation uh, uh, plane. So in this class, we're just going to use this simplified uh, uh, expression. So you just do i times omega. And then if you compare it to the, uh, the equation for linear momentum, everything is consistent, right? The r is moment of inertia, so it's equivalent to the mass in linear motion. And the angular velocity is equivalent to the linear velocity, right? So you just replace these two guys with their equivalent and uh, rotations, you get angular uh, momentum, okay? <coughs> the subtract z, as I said, means the, if it's rotating on a plane, x, y plane, then it's always the, the angular momentum is always in the z direction. But we don't need to worry about the direction, we just work with the magnitude. So that's the magnitude. And then there's a law called conservation of angular momentum, okay? So the change in the momentum, we use this big L to denote momentum in a system is going to equal to the sum of all these uh, uh, in integrals of uh, external torques Okay, and if this is real to you, compare that to conservation of angular, uh, conservation of linear momentum. Changing momentum of the system equals the sum of all the external impulses. But the impulse is defined as the force, the integral of the force over time. Right? So you, can, you see that this thing is just a rotational version of this impulse. The definition is exactly exact the same, right? The torque is the equivalent of force. So again, everything is uh, consistent. This is a complete and consistent theorem. So we could call this thing angular impulse, if you like, okay? But we just, we, we, we just don't call it that, okay? We're just gonna leave this term here. But don't be scaled by this integral. If this torque is a constant, which is what we're gonna do in this class, you integrate a constant with time, you just get torque times time, right? It's this, when the force is a constant, the impulse just becomes force times time, and that's the definition we have been using, right? If the force is a constant, okay? <clears throat> so that's what we, uh, uh, that's the last concept we wanted to introduce in this part. And then if you take a look at the slide five, uh, lecture 15, uh, 17, lecture 17, I'm sorry, slide five, this has uh, completed this table, right? The connection between, you can see the connections between the linear motion, angular motion, very beautiful theory, okay? For everything we define in linear motion, there's an equivalent in angular motion, and because we define their equivalent, we can always use the theories and laws and the skills we learn in linear motion to solve problems in this part, okay? But again, it does require a lot of practice because these things are new, very non-intuitive, okay? So that's what we are doing now. Now, uh, let's take a look at this question on slide six. On average, the sun rotates on its axis once every 27 days, okay? So that's the rotation period of the sun right now. It will turn, start to turn into a red giant in about five billion years. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, five billion years, a long way to go. It will grow so large that it will engulf Mercury, Venus, and probably Earth. Okay, not a good sign, but nothing for us to worry about, right? The sun will lose roughly 30% of its mass but expand to about 250 times its present radius, okay? Estimate the rotation period of the sun when it becomes a red giant, all right? So we want to estimate the rotation period of the sun, and then we're gonna use this uh, 
conservation of angular momentum to do that. Now let's first set up this conservation moment, angular momentum. Now the system only has one object, the sun. The sun is rotating itself, right? It's gonna be, get, uh, it's gonna lose some mass, but it's gonna get bigger and bigger. But it's all doing it itself, okay? So there's only one object. I'm just gonna use the definition of angular momentum to set up the change in angular momentum. So I just do final minus initial. Right? It's pretty much like when you set up kind of changing momentum, right? You would do mass times V and then for final minus initial. The difference in this part is that this I can also change, right? This I is not gonna be a constant, okay? Can change. It also depends on rotational axis. And in this problem, because the mass changes, the radius changes, of course, the uh, the I, the moment of inertia, because the definition of the moment of inertia depends on the mass and the radius, the size of this object. So if the, the mass and the size are changing, so this I is going to change. Okay, so that's one difference, right? The I in, in angular momentum can change, which is different than mass, right? It's equivalent to mass, but it's still a little bit different than that. Anyway, this is how I set up the left hand side. The right hand side. So the sun is rotating about its own axis, and this doesn't require any, uh, there's no external force or, or, or external torque, right? Like no one is like rotating the sun, it's giving it a torque from outside, right? So it's just rotating about its axis itself. There's uh, uh, nuclear reactions uh, going on all the time, but that's everything's within the sun, a lot of reactions in the sun, so, but nothing from the outside. We don't need to worry about that, okay? So the right hand side is gonna be zero. Okay, very good. <clears throat> but it's not always zero. We're gonna see a problem where the right, right hand side will have some number, okay? Now I set up this problem, but wait a minute. I want to find the rotational period, but this, I don't really see a rotational period here. But remember, this angular velocity is connected to the period. Right, because the velocity is also connected to the period. Right, what is the connection between the velocity and the period if something is rotating? If you still remember that, v equals distance over time. Right, I don't need to. Okay, I don't need to really remember this uh, specific equation. But how did we figure that out? I still use the definition of the de uh, velocity distance over time. Now, if it's in a circular motion, it's rotating, then it's in a circular motion. I can pick the period as the time. So what is the distance travels in one period? Circumference, right? Now I'm gonna do the same thing uh, with this angular velocity. <coughs> so angular velocity definition, changing angle divided by changing time. Right, you will get all these definitions, okay. Now, again, let's still pick the period at the time. If I pick the period at the time, what is angle it rotates in one full circle, 360 degrees or two pi radians, right? But now everything must be in SI unit, so I'm just gonna use two pi here. Okay, now you see that I can replace this uh, angular velocity with two pi divided by period. Right, two pi is not gonna change, so the period is gonna change. So I will have a final period and an initial period, which is good, because I'm looking for the final period. I already have the initial period, which is the period right now, 27 days. Okay, very good. So that's the next thing we I'm gonna do. I'm gonna replace this uh, angular velocity with two pi divided by period. Now do the same thing for the initial 2 pi over ti equals zero. All right? Now, uh, and then, if I want to find this tf, let's rearrange this equation. Let's find the expression for the tf, all right? So I would have if 2 pi divided by tf equals ii times 2 pi <coughs> divided by ti. Now we can cancel things out, right? Two pi and two pi, then we can cancel. 
Now, if you just do uh, cross multiply, what do you get? You will get TF II equals IF TI. Now, divide both sides by II. What do you get? You will get TF. <coughs> now, I'm going to continue here. IF over II, and then this whole thing times TI. Okay, very simple expression. TI is 27 days. Well, I should convert it to seconds, but let's wait a minute, right? Because these answers, they have days, hours, seconds, min, uh, minutes there. So I already know this number. I'm going to leave it here. And then IF and II, as I said, I, the moment inertia, you never need to worry about it, right? You just look it up. So let's look it up in the list of uh, all these moments of inertia. So this is a sphere, right? You can model the sun as a sphere. For a sphere, it's 2 fifth m r squared. So the I I'm going to use is going to be 2 fifth m r squared. So, uh, but the mass and the radius are changing, so that's why you will have a final I and an initial I. But let's just plug them in. So it's going to be 2 fifth final mass, final radius squared, right? Divided by 2 fifth initial mass, initial radius squared. Now TI, I'm going to still leave this TI here. Now you can go ahead and plug all the numbers and use all the information in the problem, right? You can find, so you, all you need the ratio, you don't need the actual mass of the sun, you don't need the actual radius of the sun, all you need is the ratio between them, right? And the problem from the information uh, in the problem, you can find the ratio between the final mass and the initial mass. You can find the ratio between the final radius and the initial radius. And then you finish this algebra, you will find the, uh, <coughs> the, uh, the final period, okay? Pause the video, uh, do the algebra, and then compare your answer with mine. All right, so now I'm going to plug numbers in. What do we know uh, about these two masses in, from the problem? The sun will lose roughly 30% of the mass. What's the ratio between the final mass and the initial mass? The final mass is just going to be 70% of the initial mass, right? It expand to about 250 times its present rate. Okay, final radius is going to be 250 initial radius. Okay, now I'm going to just re I can the simplest way I just replace these two expressions with these two uh, variables with these two expressions, right? So TF. And two fifths, they can be, they can cancel out. So I'm just going to have 0.7 mi at the top. That's the final mass. Now 250 ri squared, right? Mi ri squared ti. But this guy again, you're squaring the product. Don't just cancel. A lot of people, oh. This cancels this, and R squared cancels this, R squared. But there's a 250 squared, okay? So don't make that mistake. So yes, this M and M, they're going to cancel. So I will have 0.7, but this I will have 250 squared, RI squared, divided by RI squared, TI. Now this RI squared, RI squared, they're going to cancel. So you will just get 0 0.7 times 250 squared at the top, right? And then the TI is 27 days. I'm just going to plug 27 days and find the answer. If I do need to convert it to SI units, I can just convert it at the end, right? So this number I plug in, <coughs> I'll just plug in 27 days, all right? So if you finish this algebra, at the end you will get A, okay?
All right, so even if this is a free response question, I would just leave it there, because this is already a large number. I'm not going to convert it to seconds, right? Days should be fine, OK? <clears throat> All right, so, uh, and this is our conclusion, right? So uh, in about 5 billion years, the rotation period of the sun is going to become more than a million days, OK? This is our prediction. Uh, we're going to leave it for people in 5 billion years to verify, OK? Hopefully, uh, they're going to confirm our prediction, OK? Now, uh, we'll finish this question. Now we can move on to the next question, uh, slide seven. We're going to do more practice. A space station constructed in the shape of a hollow ring, okay, of mass, this number, radius 100 meters. The ring is set rotating about its axis so that people inside experience an effective centripetal acceleration equal to g, little g. The rotation is achieved by firing two small rockets attached to the rim of the ring. For what time interval must the rockets to be fired if it exerts a thrust of uh, 125 newtons? Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, what is going on in this problem? So, this is actually the uh, artificial, how to create artificial uh, gravity. We're, we're actually going to, I believe, study this again in detail uh, in the next chapter gravity. Uh, so, a uh, space station, if you have seen space stations in, in the movie, right, uh, if it's very far away from Earth, people shouldn't feel any uh, gravity. But sometimes you see they can still walk in the space station like they're walking on the Earth. How, where does this uh, gravity come from? So all you need to do is to create artificial gravity. How do you create artificial gravity? Think about this, right? If these people, they are walking on this uh, ring, right? The space station is a hollow ring. They're walking inside the ring. If all the time they feel a centripetal acceleration toward the center, exactly 9.8, they will just feel like they're walking on the Earth, right? Because they always feel 9.8 toward the center. It's pretty much what we feel on the Earth. You always feel a free fall acceleration 9.8. So the weight you feel is your mass times 9.8. If you can create a centripetal acceleration equal to 9.8 exactly uh, by rotating this space station, then these people, they just feel as if they are walking uh, on the Earth, right? So that's how we create artificial gravity. You rotate the space station to create a centripetal acceleration exactly 9.8. So that's uh, artificial gravity. Now, okay, so that's what we know. That's good to know. And then we want to find, so how does it achieve this? Work? So you, this space has to uh, start to rotate and fast and fast until it reaches that uh, centripetal acceleration, right? We want to find that if the rotation is achieved by firing two small rockets, so these two small rockets, each rocket is going to have a force. Both of them are attached to the space station. And each rocket is going to apply a force 125 to rotate the uh, uh, space station. So it's pretty, oh, I'm sorry, it's pretty much like that, right? If you apply a constant force, then you can rotate this uh, bike wheel, okay? And then these two forces are constant, which makes things easier. As I said, we're just gonna be dealing with constant forces, constant torques in this uh, class. Now let's see. Uh, I still, I, I'm, I'm gonna still use conservation of angular momentum in this part because it's rotating, right? Now, uh, I'm going to erase all this. So I'm going to still set up conservation of angular momentum using the same equation, right? Okay. Now, this guy is still IF omega F minus II omega I, right? Because that's the definition of angular momentum. Now the right-hand side is not zero because otherwise the, it's not going to rotate because the initial is zero, right? It's going to start from the rest and then these two rockets, they're going to apply that force. So this guy is going to rotate faster and faster until it achieves that centripetal acceleration. So the right-hand side is going to be the, 
external torque times the time, right? Because the force and the torque, they're constant. So it's going to be uh, this. So it's pretty much like the force, the torque times time is equivalent to force times times in this impulse, right? So again, if you like, you can call this guy angular impulse, right? Now, uh, what we want to do is this. How do we find this uh, this thread? So you see now the time is here. So that's why this is going to help us find the time. Right? Now the torque, how do I find the torque? So the eyes, you, don't, you never need to worry about I, right? You just look it up. And in this problem, is the, is the size, is the mass of the space station changing when it's rotating? No. So in this problem, IF and II, they are the same. So I don't even need the uh, uh, subscript for them. So I'm just going to write I omega F minus I omega I. Right. Now the I, look, let's, let's take a look at the list. What is the, uh, uh, the I for uh, hollow ring? For hollow ring, that's pretty much like a, a hollow cylindrical shell. Right. So that's going to be the uh, equation we use. M times R squared. That's the first one. So M R squared. All right. So that's the one I'm going to use. So I'm going to leave it there because I, I do know the mass. I do know the radius. OK, I don't need to worry about that. Now uh, the torque. Let's take a look at the torque. So the torque is going to be, torque has a definition. Everything has a definition. You just need to use the definition to find everything carefully, okay, in this part. Now, force times arm times sine phi. So let's see. Uh, I'm going to now draw a view from, that, from the top. So remember, the, okay, this is a well-designed problem for this uh, uh, class. When the rocket, okay, uh, fires and is attached to this, uh, uh, space station. So it's going to rotate with the space station. So that means the force is always going to be tangent to, right? When, when it's rotating at this point, this force is in this, this direction. At this point, is in that direction, right? So it's always uh, perpen perpendicular to the radius, okay? Now how do I find this torque? Say this is the first force, okay? I'm going to erase this. So there are two forces here, right? And another one is here. Oh, on the other side. Now this torque, uh, it's going to be force F1 uh, arm. What is the definition of arm? It's not always radius. This R looks, a lot of people, they see R, oh, that's radius. It's not always radius. Sometimes it will become radius, okay? You draw a line from the rotational axis to the where the force is applied, right? So the force is applied here. Oh, that is the radius in this problem, okay? So I'm just gonna use big R. <clears throat> now what is the angle? Phi, the phi is the angle between these two directions, F, R. And nothing's gonna change, right? When it's rotating, and next second the force in this direction the arm in that direction is still 90, right? So it's always 90. Of course, this is a well-designed problem for this class, okay? So sine 90. And then you do the same thing for F2, okay? So F2, you're going to do torque 2 equals F2 times the arm. Draw an arm from, where, from the pivot to where the forces apply. Okay, so this is still, this is R2, this is R1, okay. So this is still the radius in this problem, okay. The radius of the space station. What is the angle? 90 degrees. And these two torques, you see the force is going to be the same, right. Each exerts a thrust of 150 degree, uh, 125 newtons. So you know the force, you know the radius, this is the one. And then when you add these two torques together, as we said before, you're going to assign them correct signs. But obviously, 
these two torques, they should be in the same direction. So they will carry the same sign. You always add them, right? If you design a space station like this, and you have these two rockets rotate this space station, space station opposite directions, so these two torques cancel, what are you doing? Do you really want to rotate this space station or not, right? You don't want these two torques cancel out each other, right? You want these two torques add. So it doesn't matter if they're rotating this guy uh, clockwise or counterclockwise. They must add, okay? So that means I'm just going to do torque 1 plus torque 2 here, right? And they are actually the same because the force is the same, the arm is the same, the angle is 90, right? Because this is a well-designed problem for this class. Now, let's see. So let's, let's uh, finish the algebra. So I can even uh, factor out I on the left-hand side. Oh, I don't need to because the initial velocity is zero, right? Because the initial is not rotating, so it's going to be zero. So I will only have I omega final equals now, these two tau's, these two torques, they are the same. I would just do 2 times tau 1, right? And then delta t. Oh, don't forget delta t. Okay? So, uh, and then, you see, delta t is just going to be this. If I want to find delta t, I would just do i times omega final divided by 2 tau 1. Okay, now let's see. Tau 1, we already know that that's the force times the arm, right? 2 times the force times the arm, okay? Now, uh, I, I is m times r squared. Mass times r squared. Now, I still need the uh, angular velocity, right? What is the angular velocity? Uh, the problem doesn't tell us anything about angular velocity, but it, but it says that we want the centripetal acceleration to be equal to g. What is the centripetal acceleration equation? Centripetal acceleration equation is this, ac over equals v squared over r. Now, whenever you see v, that means you can always connect it to omega. If you can find v, you can always find uh, omega. If you can find omega, you can always find V. They're connected by the radius of this rotating object, right? Now, the problem says I want this guy to be equal to little g so that everyone on this uh, space station feels a, a free fall acceleration, 9.8, as if they're just on the Earth. So that means V must be, if you rearrange this equation, V must be, so you will want to make sure that the space station is going to rotate with this speed, right? So that everyone feels the uh, centripetal acceleration exactly little g. So that's going to be the final speed you want to achieve by rotating this uh, space station. Then what is the final uh, angular speed? Well, I just divide this thing by r, right? Well, in this problem, it's going to be bigger, r, right? So at the end, so everything becomes bigger. So omega final is going to be this thing divided by the radius of this rotating object. Now plug it in, okay? So that's going to be all right. So uh, then at the end you see a lot of things cancel out, right? A lot of things cancel out you will just get this r cancels one power of this r, and then it's going to cancel this r. So at the end, you will get m g r divided by 2f. OK? So that's why you just say, plug numbers in at the end, because when you do the algebra, you can you make cancel. You make, make uh, the expression very simple. Now you can uh, plug numbers in, and then at the end, you will get so the number I got is, okay, use your calculator to finish the algebra. Okay, so that's the time I found. And then, if this is a free response question, I just leave it there, right? But the problems uh, doesn't have this answer. If you convert it to hours, it's going to be 1.74 hours. So the right answer is C, right? <clears throat>
Okay, so we have finished this question. Still conservation of uh, angular momentum. Now let's do one uh, more practice. This is uh, another one. <coughs> so uh, this is also a classical uh, question. In this, okay, in this problem, we're going to see a system. The system have has like two objects. Again, you still just apply conservation of angular momentum. Like what you do with conservation of uh, momentum, right? If there are two objects, I'm just going to set up changing momentum for each object. Now, a student with this mass on a horizontal platform, okay, 3D rotate about frictionless vertical axis. Okay, good. Platform has a mass radius, okay. The student starts walking around the room clockwise at a constant speed of one meters per second relative to the ground. In what direction and with what angular speed does this platform rotate? So initially, no, no rotation, right? The, the student just standing still on this platform. Platform is not rotating, student is not moving. But now the student is gonna start to walking, start to walk clockwise at a constant speed of one meters per second. We want to find the uh, angular speed of the platform. Okay, rotations. I'm still gonna use a uh, conservation of uh, angular momentum. Then set it up the same way. The difference is that now we have two objects. The person, the student, and the platform. Okay, doesn't matter. The student, it's going to be the first object, right? So I'm going to erase this. So the student, let's call it. Uh, student has a mass m, right? I'm going to call it i1. Remember, the i1 is like the mass in rotations, right? And then the platform. Has a big mass. Now I'm going to call it I2, right? So I use I to uh, represent these two objects. It's like when you when I use M1 and M2 to represent two objects in linear motion. Now let's do this. I1 omega one final minus I1 omega one initial. And in this case, the I is not changing because the uh, uh, the radius, the mass is not changing, right? Plus I2 omega 2 final minus I2 omega 2 initial because the platform, the mass is not changing, the radius is not changing, so I must be the same because I, the definition of I, depends on the mass and the, the size of the object. Now, uh, this, is there any force from the outside rotating the system? No. Right? There's nothing. It's not like the previous one. Okay, these two forces on the rim are rotating this uh, uh, space station. No, nothing is rotating. The, the student is walking, okay, but that's inside the system. So there's nothing from the outside in this problem. Zero. Now let's see. Okay, everything, both of them start from rest. Right? Initially, the student is not moving. So these two guys. Sure. Okay, very nice. You only have two terms left. I1 omega 1 final plus I2 omega 2 final equals zero. Now let's rearrange this one. What are we trying to find? We want to find omega 2 final, right? We want to find uh, in what direction and with what angular speed. Angular speed is omega. Does the platform rotate? So you rearrange this equation, you will get Omega 2 final is going to be equal to negative I1 omega 1 final divided by I2. Right. Okay, so now we can plug numbers in and then find this uh, omega 2 final. I1, I2, I's you never need to worry about. The student, okay, what is the I for student? The list doesn't have that. The student, you can model as an isolated point mass on the platform, right? So the student, the I1, you just do M, 
R squared, right? Because that's the definition of I. You sum up all these little pieces with the radius squared. But if it's an isolated point mass, it's just one piece, right? So you don't need to add anything. But this radius is going to be the radius of the student, OK? So the student is rotating, right? The student is in a circular motion relative to the center of the platform. So it totally depends on where the student is. This problem says the student is at the rim. So OK, the student will have a radius which equals to the radius of the platform. Okay, so in this case, this is going to become m times big R as well. But the student can be at a different location. Say the student is at halfway between this uh, center and the rim. What is going to be the little r you plug in? That's going to be one half times the radius of the platform. Okay, you need to understand this little r is always the radius of the circular motion of this rotating object. If it's at a uh, isolated point mass, okay? It's not always the radius in the problem, okay? Whenever you see this little R, you just, you just look for, is there a radius in the problem? I'm going to plug it in. Then you don't understand these equations. You don't understand the uh, theory. You only know how to plug numbers in, okay? And this is what we were learning in physics. So in this case, and I believe you will get some questions where uh, the, the radius is different than the radius in the problem on the homework, so you can practice. Now I2 is a platform. So platform is a disk. As disk rotating, then we will find the I for the disk. So the disk is 1 half m r squared, OK? So that's going to be 1 half m r squared. And this r is going to be the uh, uh, radius of the platform. Okay, because the platform has its own radius, it's, it's going to be its own radius. The person doesn't have a radius, right? So the radius it is in a circular motion. So the radius is the radius of the, the student's circular motion, right? Like if you talk about a person, like, do I have a radius? I don't, right? Okay. <clears throat> All right, so now let's plug numbers in. Well, wait a minute. I still need the omega 1 final, right? What is omega 1 final? So that's the angular speed of the student. But the problem doesn't say the angular speed of the student. It just says the student walks clockwise at a constant speed, 1 meters per second. Okay, but now you know speed, then you also know angular speed. If you know angular speed, you also know the speed, because they're always connected by the R, okay? So for the student, the omega 1f is going to always be v1f divided by r. Again, this r is the radius of the student. How come the student has a radius? Because the student is moving in a circle. You're going to use that radius, the radius of the circle, to plug in. Is this always the radius in the problem? I'm not sure. I should read this problem careful. Where is the student? The student is at the rim. The student is moving in a circle with a radius the same as the radius of the platform in this question. So I can plug in the big R, OK? And then V1F, the problem says it's 1 meter per second, OK? Now we can plug numbers in, right? So I1 M R squared, omega 1 f v 1 f divided by r and then the uh, i2 is 1 half big m r squared okay so uh and then it's going to be negative so a lot of things can cancel out right so it's just going to be 2 m v 1 f divided by r right so now you can plug numbers in Okay, because that's as simple as we can get. Because r squared and r squared cancel. Then you will get, if you plug numbers in, you will get negative 0.56 radians per second. Okay, so that means the angular speed of the uh, platform is going to be 0.56 radians per second. Okay, good. 
What about the negative sign? The negative sign means it's opposite to the positive direction assumed. I didn't, do, I didn't assume any positive direction when I uh, did the math, you did. Because when you do this, you are assuming omega one half, one final is positive. What is the direction of omega one final? That's the direction of the student. The student is walking clockwise. So you are assuming clockwise, angular velocity clockwise is positive. So the negative sign just means it's rotating counterclockwise, right? You see that the math is gonna tell you both the direction and the magnitude, okay? You don't need to erase any negative signs because these signs, they're telling you something, okay? All right, so that's this uh, question. Now, there's a second part. Let's take a look at the second part. Find the change in the kinetic energy of the system, the student and the platform, okay? How do I find the change in the kinetic energy? If I want to find the change in the kinetic energy, well, I would just do final kinetic energy minus initial kinetic energy, right? Because that's the definition. And I don't even need to use a law because the problem just wants me to find the change in kinetic energy. So that's going to be K final minus K initial. And there's a system, right? So I would do K total final minus K total initial. What is the initial kinetic energy of the system? Well, they start from rest, right? Initially, they're not moving only because the student starts to walk, the platform rotates in the other direction, which is intuitive. I hope it's intuitive to us. If you have tried this, right, if you walk in one direction, the platform is always going to be uh, <coughs> rotating in the other direction. So this is going to be zero. So all you need to do actually is just calculate the uh, total or kinetic gain the final. And then how do I calculate the total kinetic gain the final? Well, you just use the, this is omega 2f, okay? So you would just do this, right? I, I would just do k1 final plus k2 final, right? So both of them are rotating, so you would just do 1 half i1 omega 1 final squared plus 1 half i2 omega 2f squared, okay? And then i1 is the student, so it's going to be one half m r squared times v omega y. Well, omega y f is this, right? So let's plug it in. V one f over r. This whole thing squared. And then this thing. Well, we just calculated it. omega two f. Right, so you just plug it in. In this case, you don't need to worry about the sign. Even if you carry the sign, you still get the right answer because there's a square here, okay? And then at the end, you will find, so if you finish this algebra here, you can find that omega 2f, I'm gonna write it here. Right. You would even find this is going to be equal to one half m v squared. So for the student, because it's an isolated point mass, you use this or this, you will get the exact same answer, right? Everything is consistent in physics, everything, okay? Okay, put these numbers in and then use your calculator. You can find the right answer. It's gonna be 46 joules. <coughs> now the question is this, I wanna ask you, where does this energy come from? Because remember, initially, the total kinetic energy is zero, right? The total kinetic, this is not the total kinetic energy. This is the final. The total kinetic energy is zero. But the final kinetic is 46 joules. So they get some, the whole system gets some energy out of nothing. Where does that come from? Does this violate conservation of energy? Are you shaking your head? Okay, if you're shaking, that's right. 
you have a very good, uh, you have very strong belief in these conservation laws because these conservation laws, they, we haven't found ever any evidence against that. Then how do I explain that? Where does this energy come from? This energy comes from not potential energy, okay, comes from the person, okay, comes from the student. Because a person can do work to the outside. We can convert the energy, the chemical energy from the food we eat to other types of energy, right? You go to gym, you can work out. Now the gym is even closed now, okay? You can uh, do work. So a human can do work to uh, the outside, right? So this work actually comes from, totally comes from the, uh, the student, okay? So that's why this is also a perfect example where you see that you should use conservation of angular momentum. You shouldn't use conservation of energy because that involves uh, different forms of energy. The chemical energy from the person, uh, from the food the person eats, okay? All right, so uh, I'm gonna uh, stop here for this uh, video.